A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams. The world is full of black holes, and you might just be one. Scene four. It is early the following morning. There is the confusion of street cries like a choral chant. Stella is lying down in the bedroom. Her face is serene in the early morning sunlight. One hand rests on her belly, rounding slightly with new maternity. From the other dangles a book of color comics. Her eyes and lips have that almost narcotized tranquility that is the faces of Eastern idols. The table is sloppy with the remains of breakfast and the debris of the preceding night and Stanley's gaudy pajamas lie across the threshold of the bathroom. The outside door is slightly ajar on a sky of summer brilliance. Blanche appears at this door. She has spent a sleepless night and her appearance entirely contrasts with Stella's. She presses her knuckles nervously to her lips as she looks through the door before entering. Stella? Hmm? Blanche utters a moaning cry and runs into the bedroom, throwing herself down beside Stella in a rush of hysterical tenderness. Oh, baby, my baby sister. Stella draws away from her. Blanche, what is the matter with you? Blanche straightens up slowly and stands beside the bed, looking down at her sister with her knuckles pressed to her lips. He's left? Stan? Yes. Will he be back? He's gone to get the car greased. Why? Oh, why, I've been half crazy, Stella. When I found out that you'd been insane enough to come back in here after what happened, I, I started to rush in after you. I'm glad you didn't. What were you thinking of? Stella makes an indefinite gesture. <sighs> Answer me. What? What? Please, Blanche, sit down and stop yelling. All right, Stella. I will repeat the question quietly now. How could you come back in this place last night? What? You must have slept with him. Stella gets up in a calm and leisurely way. Blanche, I've forgotten how excitable you are. You're making too much fuss about this. Am I? Yes, you are, Blanche. I know how it must have seemed to you, and I'm awfully sorry that it had to happen, but it wasn't anything as serious as you seem to take it. In the first place, when men are drinking and playing poker, Anything can happen. It's always a powder keg. He didn't know what he was doing. He was as good as a lamb when I came back, and he's really very, very ashamed of himself. And that makes it all right. No, it isn't all right for anybody to make such a terrible row, but people do it sometimes. Stanley's always smashed things. Why, on our wedding night, as soon as we came in here, he snatched off one of my slippers and rushed about the, pl the place smashing light bulbs with it. He did what? He smashed all the light bulbs with the heel of my slipper. And you let him? You didn't run, didn't scream? I was sort of thrilled by it. She waits for a moment. Eunice and you had breakfast? Do you suppose I wanted my breakfast? There's some coffee left on the stove. You're so matter of fact about it, Stella. What other can I be? He's taken the radio to get it fixed. It didn't land on the pavement, so only one tube was smashed. And, and you are here smiling and standing there. What do you want me to do? Well, pull yourself together and face the facts. What are they, in your opinion? In my opinion, you're married to a madman. No. Yes, you are. Your fix is worse than mine, only you're not sensible about it. I'm gonna do something. Uh, get a hold of myself and make a new life. Yes. But you've given in, and, and that isn't right. You're not old. You can get out. I'm not in anything I want to get out of. Uh, what? Stella? I said I'm not in anything that I have a desire to get out of. Look at the mess in this room and those empty bottles. They went through two cases last night. He promised this morning that he was going to quit having these poker parties, but you know how long such a promise is going to keep. Well, it's his pleasure. Like mine is movies and bridge. People have got to tolerate each other's habits, I guess. I don't understand you. Stella turns towards her. I don't understand your indifference. Is this a Chinese philosophy you've cultivated? It's what, what? <laughs> this shuffling about, mumbling, one tube smashed, beer bottles, mess in the kitchen, as if nothing out of the ordinary has happened. 
Stella laughs uncertainly and picking up the broom, twirls it in her hands. Are you deliberately shaking that thing in my face? No. Stop it, let go of that broom. I won't have you cleaning up for him. Then who's going to do it? Are you? I, I? No, didn't think so. Oh, let me think. If only my mind would function, we've, we've got to get a hold of some money. That's the way out. I guess that money is always nice to get a hold of. Listen to me, I have an idea of some kind. Shakily, she twists a cigarette into her holder. Do you remember Shep Huntley? Stella, Stella shakes her head. Of course you would remember Shep Huntley. I, I went out with him at college and wore his pin for a while. Well, well, I ran into him last winter. You know how I went to Miami during the Christmas holidays? No. Well, I did, and, and the, I took the trip as an investment, thinking I'd meet someone with a million dollars. Did you? Yes, I ran into Shep Huntley. I ran into him on Biscayne Boulevard on Christmas Eve about dusk, getting into his car, a Cadillac convertible. Oh, must have been a block long. I should think it would have been inconvenient in traffic. <laughs> You've heard of oil wells? Yes, remotely. He has them all over Texas. Texas is literally spouting gold in his pockets. My, my. <laughs> You know how indifferent I am to money. I think of money in terms of what it does for you, but but he could do it. Yes, yes, he certainly could do it. Do what, Blanche? Why, set us up in a shop. What kind of a shop? Oh, a shop of some kind. He could do it with half of what his wife throws away at the races. He's married. Oh, honey, would I be here if the man weren't married? Stella laughs a little. Blanche suddenly springs up and crosses to the phone. She speaks shrilly. How do I get Western Union? Operator, Western Union! It's a dial phone, honey. Well, I can't dial. I'm too... Just dial zero. O? Oh? Yes, O for operator. Blanche considers for a moment, then she puts the phone down. Give me a pencil. Where's a slip of paper? I've got to write it down first. The, the message, I mean. She goes to the dressing table and grabs up a sheet of Kleenex and an eyebrow pencil for writing equipment. Now, let me see now. She bites the pencil. Darling Shep, sister and I in desperate situation. I beg your pardon. Sister and I in desperate situation. We'll explain details later. Would you be interested in... She bites the pencil again. Would you be interested in... She smashes the pencil on the table and springs up. Oh, you never get anywhere with direct appeals. Don't be so ridiculous, darling. Oh, but I'll think of something. I've got to think of, of something. Oh, don't, don't laugh at me, Stella. Please, please don't. I don't want you to look at the contents of my purse. Here's what's in it. She snatches, the, she snatches her purse open. 65 measly cents in the coin of the realm. Stella crosses to the bureau. Stanley doesn't give me regular allowance. He likes to pay bills himself, but this morning he gave me $10 to smooth things over. You take five of it, Blanche, and I'll keep the rest. Oh, no, no, Stella. I know how it helps your morale just to have a little money in your pocket. Oh, no, thank you. I'll take to the streets. Talk sense. How do you happen, how did you happen to get so low on funds? Money just goes. It, it goes places. She rubs her forehead. Oh, sometime today, I've, I've got to get a hold of a bromo. I'll fix you one now. Oh, not, not yet. I've got to keep thinking. I wish you'd just let things go, at least for a while. Stella, I can't live with him. You can. He's your husband. But how could I stay here with him after last night with just those curtains between us? Blanche, you saw him at his worst last night. On the contrary, I saw him at his best. But what such a man has to offer is animal force, and he gave a wonderful exhibition of that, but the only way to live with such a man is to go to bed with him, and that's your job, not mine. <laughs> After you've rested a little, you'll see it's going to work out. You don't have to worry about anything while you're here. I mean, expenses... I have to plan for both of us, to, to get us both out. You take it for granted that I'm in something that I want to get out of. 
could take it for granted that you still have sufficient memory of Bell Reeve to find this place and these poker players impossible to live with. Well, you're taking entirely too much for granted. I can't believe you're in earnest. No. I, under, I understand how it happened a little. You, you saw him in uniform as an officer, not here, but... I'm not sure it would have made any difference where I saw him. Don't, don't you say it was one of those mysterious electric things between people? If you do, I'll laugh in your face. I'm not going to say anything more about it at all. All right, then don't. But there are things that happen between a man and a woman in the dark that sort of make everything else seem unimportant. What you are talking about is brutal desire, just desire. The name of that rattle trap streetcar that bangs through the quarter, up one narrow street and down another. Haven't you ever ridden on that streetcar? You brought me here where I'm not wanted and where I'm ashamed to be. Then don't you think your superior attitude is a bit out of place? I am not being or feeling superior at all, Stella. Believe me, I'm not. It's just this. This is how I look at it. A man like that is someone to go out with once, twice, three times when the devil's in you, but live with, have a child by? I have told you that I love him. That I tremble for you. I just... I tremble for you. I can't help your trembling if you insist on trembling. May I speak plainly? Yes, do. Go ahead, as plainly as you want to. Outside, a train approaches. They are silent till the noise subsides. They are both in the bedroom. Under cover of the train's noise, Stanley enters from outside. He stands unseen by the women, holding some packages in his arms and overhears their following conversation. He wears an undershirt and grease-stained seersucker pants. Well, if you'll forgive me, he's common. Why, yes, I suppose he is. Suppose? You can't have forgotten that much of our upbringing, Stella that you suppose that any part of a gentleman's in his nature, not one particle, no. Oh, if he was just ordinary, just plain, but good and wholesome, but no, there is something downright bestial about him. Oh my God, you're hating me saying this, aren't you? Go on and say it all, Blanche. Well, he acts like an animal. He has an animal's habits. He eats like one, moves like one, and talks like one. There's even something subhuman, something not quite to the stage of humanity yet. Yes, something, something ape-like about him, like one of those pictures I've seen in anthropological studies. Thousands and thousands of years have just passed him right by, and there he is, Stanley Kowalski, survivor of the Stone Age, bearing that raw meat home from the kill in the jungle, and you, you here waiting for him, like maybe he'll strike you or maybe he'll grunt and kiss you. And that is if kisses have been discovered yet, nights fall and the other apes gather there in the front of the cave, all grunting like him and swilling and gnawing and hulking. And this poker night, you call it, this party of apes, somebody growls, some creature snatches at something and the fight is on, God, maybe we're a long way from being made in God's image, but Stella, my sister, there has been some progress since then. Such things as, as art and poetry and music, such kinds of new light have come into the world since then. And some kinds of people, some tenderer feelings have had some little beginning. And we've got to make that grow and, and cling to and hold as our flag in this dark march towards whatever it is we're approaching and, and don't hang back with the brutes. Another train passes outside. Stanley hesitates, licking his lips. Then suddenly he turns stealthily about and withdraws through the front door. The women are still unaware of his presence. When the train has passed, he calls through the closed front door. Hey, hey Stella. Stanley. Still, I. But Stella has gone to the front door. Stanley enters casually with his packages. Hi, Stella. Blanche back? Yes, she's back. Hi, Blanche. He grins at her. You must have got under the car. Damn mechanics at Fritz don't know their ass from Hey! Stella has embraced him with both arms fiercely and in full view of Blanche. He laughs and clasps her head to him. 
Over her head, he grins through the curtains at Blanche. As the lights fade away with the lingering brightness on their embrace, the music of the blue piano and trumpet and drums is heard. Scene five. Blanche is seated in the bedroom, fanning herself with a palm leaf as she reads over a just completed letter. Suddenly she bursts into a peal of laughter. Stella is dressing in the bedroom. What are you laughing at, honey? Oh, myself, myself for being such a liar. I'm writing a letter to Shep. She picks up the letter. Oh, darling Shep, I am spending the summer on the wing, making flying visits here and there. And who knows, perhaps I shall take a sudden notion to swoop down on Dallas. How would you feel about that? <laughs> She laughs nervously and brightly, touching her throat as if actually talking to Shep. Forewarned is forearmed, as they say. <laughs> oh, how does that sound? Uh huh. Uh, most of my sister's friends go north in the summer, but some have homes on the Gulf, and, and there has been a continued round of entertainments uh, teas, cocktails, and luncheons. A disturbance is heard upstairs at the Hubble's apartment. Eunice seems to be having some trouble with Steve. Eunice's voice shouts in terrible wrath. I heard about you and that blonde. That's a damn lie. You ain't pulling the wool over my eyes. I wouldn't mind if you'd stay down at the Four Deuces, but you always going up. Whoever seen me up? I seen you chasing her around the balcony. I'm gonna call the vice squad. Don't you throw that at me. You hit me. I'm gonna call the police. A clatter of aluminum striking a wall is heard, followed by a man's angry roar, shouts, and overturned furniture. There is a crash, then a relative hush. Did he kill her? Eunice appears on the steps in demonic disorder. No, she's coming downstairs. Call the police. I'm gonna call the police. She rushes around the corner. They laugh lightly. Stanley comes around the corner in his green and scarlet silk bowling shirt. He trots up the steps and bangs into the kitchen. Blanche registers his entrance with nervous gestures. What's the matter with Eunice? She and Steve had a row. Has she got the police? <laughs> nah, she's getting a drink. That's much more practical. Steve comes down nursing a bruise on his forehead and looks in the door. She here? Nah, nah, four deuces. That rotting hunk. He looks around the corner a bit timidly, then turns with affected boldness and runs after her. I must jot that down in my notebook. <laughs> I'm compiling a little notebook of quaint little words and phrases I've picked up here. You don't pick up nothing here you ain't heard before. Can I count on that? You can count on up to 500. Well, that's a mighty high number. He jerks open the bureau drawer, slams it shut, and throws his shoes in a corner. At each noise, Blanche winces slightly. Finally, she speaks. <laughs> what sign were you born under? Sign? Well, astrological sign. I bet you were born under Aries. Aries people are forceful and dynamic and they dote on noise. They love to bang things around. You must have had lots of banging around in the army and now that you're out, you're making up for it by treating inanimate objects with such a fury. Stella has been going in and out of the closet during this scene and now she pops her head out of the closet. Stanley was born just five minutes after Christmas. Ooh, Capricorn, the goat. What sign were you born under? My birthday's next month on the 15th of September. That's under Virgo. What's Virgo? Virgo is the virgin. Hmm. He advances a little as he knots his tie. Say, you happen to know somebody named Shaw? Her face expresses a faint shock. She reaches for the cologne bottle and dampens her handkerchief as she answers carefully. Why, everyone knows someone named Shaw. This? Somebody named Shaw is under the impression he met you and Laurel. But I figure he must have gotten you mixed up with some other party because this other party is someone he met at a hotel called the Flamingo. Blanche laughs breathlessly as she touches the cologne dampened handkerchief to her temples. I'm afraid he does have me mixed up with this other party. The Hotel Flamingo is not the sort of establishment that I would dare to be seen in. You know of it? Uh, yes, I've seen it and smelled it. You must have gotten pretty close to you smelling. The odor of cheap perfume is penetrating. The stuff you use expensive? $25 an ounce. I'm nearly out. That's just a, a hint if you want to remember for my birthday. She speaks lightly, but her voice has a note of fear. So I must have got you mixed up. He goes in and out of Laurel all the time so he can check on it and clear up any mistake. 
He turns away and crosses to the portieres. Blanche closes her eyes as if faint. Her hand trembles as she lifts the handkerchief again to her forehead. Steve and Eunice come around the corner. Steve's arm is around Eunice's shoulder, and she is sobbing luxuriously, and he is cooing love words. There is a murmur of thunder as they go slowly upstairs in a tight embrace. I'll wait for you at the four deuces. Hey, don't I rate one kiss? Well, not in front of your sister. He goes out. Blanche rises from her chair. She seems faint, looks about her with an expression of almost panic. Stella, what have you heard about me? Huh? What have people been telling you about me? Telling? You haven't heard any unkind gossip about me? Why, no, Blanche, of course not. Honey, there was a, a good deal of talk in Laurel. About you, Blanche? I wasn't so good the last two years or so after Belle Reeve had started to flip through my fingers. All of us do things. We. I was never hard or, or self-sufficient enough. When, when people are soft, they gotta shimmer and glow. We gotta put on soft colors, the colors of butterfly wings. You gotta put a paper lantern over the light. It, it isn't enough to be soft. You've gotta be soft and attractive and, and, and I'm fading now. I don't know how much longer I can turn the trick. The afternoon is faded to dusk. Stella goes into the bedroom and turns on the light under the paper lantern. She holds a bottled soft drink in her hand. Have you been listening to me? I don't listen to you when you've been talking morbid. She advances with the bottled Coke. Is that Coke for me? Not for anyone else. Oh, why, you precious thing, you. Is it just Coke? You mean you want a shot in it? Well, honey, a shot never does a Coke any harm. Oh, let me. You mustn't wait on me. I'd li I like to wait on you, Blanche. It makes it seem more like home. She goes into the kitchen and finds a glass and pours a shot of whiskey into it. I have to admit, I love being waited on. She rushes into the bedroom. Stella goes to her with the glass. Blanche suddenly clutches Stella's free hand with a moaning sound and presses the hand to her lips. Stella is embarrassed by her show of emotion. Blanche speaks in a choked voice. You're, you're so good to me, and I... Blanche. I, I know, I won't. You hate me to talk sentimental, but, but honey, I believe I feel things more than I tell you. I won't stay long. I, I won't, I promise. I... Blanche. I won't. I promise I'll go. I'll go soon. I really will. I won't hang around here until he, he throws me out. Now, will you stop talking foolish? Oh, yes, honey. Oh, watch how you pour that. That fizzy stuff buzzes over. Blanche laughs shrilly and grabs the glass, but her hand shakes so much it almost slips from her glass. Stella pours the Coke into the glass. It foams over and spills. Blanche gives a piercing cry. Ah! <laughs> right on my pretty white skirt. Oh, use my hanky. Black gently. I uh, know. Uh, gently. Gently. Did it stain? Oh, not a bit. <laughs> Isn't that lucky? <laughs> she sits down, shaking, taking a grateful drink. She holds the glass in both hands and continues to laugh a little. <laughs> why did you scream like that? I don't know why I screamed. <laughs> Mitch, Mitch is coming at seven, and I guess I'm just feeling nervous about our relations. <laughs> He hasn't gotten anything but a good night kiss. That, that's all I've given him, Stella. I, I want his respect. And men don't want anything they get too easy. But on the other hand, men lose interest quickly, especially when a girl is over uh, 30. They think that a girl over 30 ought to, the vulgar term is, put out. And I am not putting out. Of course, he doesn't know. I mean, I, I haven't informed him of my real age. Why are you so sensitive about your age? because of hard knocks my vanity has been given. What I mean is he thinks I'm sort of prim and proper, you know? She laughs sharply. <laughs> I want to deceive him enough to make him want me. Blanche, do you want him? I want to rest. I want to breathe quietly again. And, and yes, I, I want Mitch very badly. Just think if it happens, I can leave here and not be anyone's problem. Stanley comes around the corner with a drink under his belt. Hey, Steve. Hey, Eunice. Hey, Stella. There are joyous calls from above. Trumpet and drums are heard from around the corner. It will happen. It will? It will. She goes across into the kitchen, looking back at Blanche. It will, honey. It will. But don't take another drink. Her voice catches as she goes up the door to meet her husband. 
Blanche sinks faintly back into her chair with her drink. Eunice shrieks with laughter and runs down the steps. Steve bounds after her with goat-like screeches and chases her around the corner. Stanley and Stella twine arms as they follow, laughing. Dusk settles deeper. The music from the four deuces is slow and blue. Hummy, hummy, hummy. Her eyes fall shut and the palm leaf fan drops from her fingers. She slaps her hand on the chair a couple of times. There is a little glimmer of lightning about the building. A young man comes along the street and rings the bell. Come in. The young man appears through the portieres. She regards him with interest. Well, well, what can I do for you? I'm collecting for the Evening Star. Well, I didn't know that stars took up collections. It's the paper. I <laughs> know, I know. I was joking feebly. Uh, will you have a drink? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, no, thank you. I can't drink on the book job. Oh, well, now let's see. Oh, I don't have a dime. I'm not the lady of the house. I'm her sister from Mississippi. One of those poor relations you've heard about. That's all right. I'll, I'll drop by later. He starts to go out. She approaches a little. Hey. He turns back shyly. She puts a cigarette in a long holder. Could you give me a light? She crosses towards him. They meet at the door between the two rooms. Sure. He takes out a lighter. This doesn't always work. It's temperamental. It flares. Ah, oh, thank you. He starts away again. Hey. He turns again, still more uncertainly. She goes close to him. Oh, what time is it? Uh, 15 of seven, ma'am. So late. Don't you just love these long rainy afternoons in New Orleans? When an hour isn't just an hour, but a little piece of eternity dropped into your hands. And who knows what to do with it? She touches his shoulders. You uh, didn't get wet in the rain? Uh, no, ma'am. I stepped inside. In a drugstore? Had a soda? Uh-huh. Chocolate? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, cherry. <laughs> cherry? <laughs> yeah, cherry soda. Oh, you make my mouth water. She touches his cheek lightly and smiles. Then she goes to the trunk. Well, I'd better be going. Young man. She turns. She takes a large gossamer scarf from the trunk and drapes it about her shoulders. In the ensuing pause, the blue piano is heard. It continues through the rest of this scene and the opening of the next. The young man clears his throat and looks yearningly at the door. Young man, young, young man. Has anyone ever told you you look like a young prince out of the Arabian Nights? The young man laughs uncomfortably and stands like a bashful kid. Blanche speaks softly to him. Well, you do, honey lamb. Come here. I want to kiss you just once, softly and sweetly on your mouth. Without waiting for him to accept, she crosses quickly to him and presses her lips to his. Now, run along. Quickly. It would be nice to keep you, but I've got to be good and keep my hands off children. He stares at her for a moment. She opens the door for him and blows a kiss at him as he goes down the steps with a dazed look. She stands there a little dreamily after he has disappeared. Then Mitch appears around the corner with a bunch of roses. Oh, look who's coming. My rose and cavalier. Oh, bow to me first. And now present them. Oh, merci. She looks at him over them, coquettishly pressing them to her lips. He beams at her self-consciously. Scene six. It is about 2 a.m. on the same evening. The outer wall of the building is visible. Blanche and Mitch come in. The utter exhaustion which only a neuroasthenic personality can know is evident in Blanche's voice and manner. Mitch is stolid but depressed. They have probably been out to the amusement park on Lake Pontchartrain train for Mitch's bearing upside down a plaster statuette of Mae West, the sort of prize won at shooting galleries and carnival games of chance. Well. Uh, well. Uh, oh. <clears throat> I guess it must be pretty late and you're tired. Even the hot tamale man has deserted the street and he hangs on till the end. <sighs> How will you get home? I'll walk over to Bourbon and catch an owl car. <laughs> Is that streetcar named Desire still grinding along the tracks at this hour? 
I'm afraid you haven't gotten much fun out of this evening, Blanche. I spoiled it for you. No, you didn't, but I felt all the time I wasn't giving you much entertainment. I simply couldn't rise to the occasion. That was all. I don't think I've ever tried so hard to be gay and made such a dismal mess of it. I get 10 points for trying, though. And I did try. Why did you try if you didn't feel like it, Blanche? I was just obeying the laws of nature. Which law is that? The one that says a lady must entertain the gentleman, or no dice. See if you can locate my door key in this purse. When I'm so tired, my fingers are all thumbs. Uh, this it? No, honey, that's, that's the key to my trunk, which I must soon be packing. You mean you are leaving here soon? I've outstayed my welcome. This it? The music fades away. Eureka! Oh, honey, you open the door while I take one last look at the sky. She leans on the porch rail. He opens the door and stands awkwardly behind her. I'm looking for the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters. But these girls are not out tonight. Oh, yes, yes they are. There they are. Oh, God bless them. All in a little bunch going home from their little bridge party. You get the door open? Oh, good boy. I guess you want to go now. He shuffles and coughs a little. Uh, can I uh, kiss you goodnight? Why do you always ask me if you may? I don't know whether you want me to or not. Why should you be so doubtful? That night when we parked by the lake and I kissed you, you... Oh, honey, it wasn't the kiss I objected to. I liked the kiss very much. It was the other little familiarity I, I felt obliged to discourage. I didn't resent it. Oh, not, not a bit in the world. In fact, I was somewhat flattered that you desired me. But honey, you know as well as I do that a single girl alone in the world has got to keep a firm hold on her emotions or she'll be lost. Lost? I guess you're used to girls that like to be lost. The kind that get lost immediately on the very first date. I like you to be exactly the way you are because in all my experience, I have never known anyone like you. Blanche looks at him gravely, then she bursts into laughter and then claps a hand to her mouth. <laughs> Are you laughing at me? Oh, no, honey, no. The lord and the lady of the house have not yet returned, so come in. We'll, we'll have a little nightcap. Let's leave the lights off, shall we? You just do what you want to. Blanche precedes him into the kitchen. The outer wall of the building disappears and the interiors of the two rooms can dimly be seen. The other were rooms more comfortable. Go, go on in. This crashing around in the dark is my search for some liquor. You want a drink? I want you to have a drink. You've been so anxious and solemn all evening, and, and so have I. We've both been anxious and solemn, and now for these last few remaining moments of our lives together, I want to create joie de vivre. I'm, I'm lighting a candle. That's good. We're going to be very bohemian. We're going to pretend that we're sitting in a little artist cafe on the left bank in Paris. She lights a candle stub and puts it in a bottle. La suis la dame au camélia, vous êtes Armand. <laughs> Understand French? No, no, I... Oh, voulez-vous coucher avec moi ce soir? Vous ne comprenez pas? Oh, quel dommage. <laughs> I mean, it's a damn good thing I found some liquor. Just enough for two shots without any dividends. Honey? That's good. She enters the bedroom with the drinks and the candle. Sit down. Why don't you take your coat off and loosen your collar? I better leave it on. No, I want you to be comfortable. I'm ashamed of the way I perspire. My shirt is sticking to me. Perspiration is healthy. If people didn't perspire, they'd die in five minutes. She takes his coat from him. Oh, this is a nice coat. What what kind of material is it? Uh, they call that stuff alpaca. Oh, alpaca. It's very lightweight, alpaca. Oh, lightweight alpaca. I don't like to wear a wash coat even in the summer because I sweat through it. Oh? And I, it don't look neat on me. 
a man with heavy bill has got to be careful what he puts on him so he don't look too clumsy. You're not too heavy. You don't think I am? You're not the delicate type. You have a, a massive bone structure and a very imposing physique. Thank you. Last Christmas, I was given a membership to the New Orleans Athletic Club. Oh, good. It was the finest present I was ever given. I work out there with the weights and I swim and keep myself fit. When I started there, I was getting soft in the belly, but now my belly's hard. It is so hard now that a man can punch me in the belly and it don't hurt me. Punch me. Go on, see? She pokes lightly at him. <laughs> Gracious. Her hand touches her chest. Guess how much I weigh, Blanche. Oh, I'd say in the vicinity of 180. Guess again. Not that much? No, more. Oh, well, you're a tall man and you carry a good deal of weight without looking awkward. I weigh 207 pounds. I'm six feet one and one half inches tall in my bare feet with, without shoes on. And that is what I weigh, stripped. Oh my goodness. Oh me, it's all inspiring. Uh, my weight is not a very interesting subject to talk about. What's yours? My weight? Yes. I guess. Let me lift you. Oh, Samson, go on, lift me. He comes behind her and puts his hands on her waist and raises her lightly off the ground. Well? You're as light as a feather. <laughs> he lowers her but keeps his hands on her waist. Blanche speaks with an affection of demureness. You may release me now. Huh? I said unhand me, sir. He fumblingly embraces her. Her voice sounds gently reproving. Oh, now, Mitch, just because Stanley and Stella aren't home is no reason why you shouldn't behave like a gentleman. Just give me a slap whenever I step out of bounds. Oh, that won't be necessary. You're a natural gentleman. One of the very few that are left in the world. I don't want you to think that I'm severe and old maid school teacherish or anything like that. It's just, well, huh? I guess it's just that I have old fashioned ideals. She rolls her eyes knowing he cannot see her face. Mitch goes to the front door. There is a considerable silence between them. Blanche sighs and Mitch coughs self-consciously. <clears throat> Where's Stanley and Stella tonight? Well, they've gone out with Mr. and Mrs. Hubble upstairs. Where did they go? I think they were planning to go to a, a midnight purview at Lowe's State. Well, we should all go out together some night. No, that wouldn't be a good plan. Uh, why not? You are an old friend of Stanley's? And we was together in 241st. I guess he talks to you frankly. Sure. Has he talked to you about me? Oh, not very much. The way you say that, I suspect he has. No, he hasn't said much. But what he has said, what would you say his attitude was towards me? Why do you want to ask that? Well. Don't you get along with him? What do you think? I don't think he understands you. <laughs> Let's put it mildly. If it weren't for Stella about to have a baby, I, I wouldn't be able to endure things here. He isn't nice to you? Well, he is insufferably rude. Goes out of his way to offend me. In what way, Blanche? Not in every conceivable way. I'm surprised to hear that. Are you? Well, I don't see how anybody could be rude to you. It's really a pretty frightful situation. You see, there's no privacy here. There's just these little portiers between two rooms at night. He, he stalks through the rooms in his underwear at night and I have to ask him to close the bathroom door. <laughs> that sort of commonness isn't necessary. You probably wonder why I don't move out. Well, I'll tell you frankly, a teacher's salary is barely sufficient for her living expenses. I didn't save a penny last year, so I had to come up here for the summer. That's why I have to put up with my sister's husband and he has to put up with me, so apparently against his wishes. Surely he must have told you how much he hates me. I don't think he hates you. Oh, he hates me, or why would he insult me? The first time I laid eyes on him, I thought to myself, that man is my executioner. That man will destroy oh, me unless... Yes, honey? 
Can I ask you a question? Yes. What? How old are you? She makes a nervous gesture. <laughs> Why do you want to know? I talked to my mother about you and she said, how old is Blanche? And I wasn't able to tell her. There's another pause. You talked to your mother about me? Yes. Why? I told my mother how nice you were and I liked you. Were you sincere about that? You know I was. Why did your mother want to know my age? Mother is sick. I'm sorry to hear it. Badly? She won't live long. Oh. Like just a few months. Oh. She worries because I'm not settled. Oh. She wants me to be settled down before she... His voice is hoarse and he clears his throat twice, shuffling nervously around with his hands in and out of his pockets. You love her very much, don't you? Yes. I think you have a great capacity for devotion. You'll be lonely when she passes on, won't you? Mitch clears his throat and nods. I understand what that is. Be lonely? I loved someone too. And the person I loved, I lost. Dead? She crosses to the window and sits on the sill, looking out. She pours herself another drink. A man? He was a boy. Just a boy when I was a very young girl. When I was 16, I made the discovery. Love. All at once and much, much too completely. It was like you suddenly turned a blinding light on something that had always been half in shadow. That's how it struck the world for me. But I was unlucky, deluded. There was something different about the boy, a nervousness, a softness and a tenderness, which wasn't like a man's. Although he wasn't the least bit effeminate looking, still there was that there. He came to me for help. And I, I didn't know that. I, I didn't find out anything until after our marriage when we'd run away and come back and all I knew was that I'd failed him in some mysterious way and, and wasn't able to give him the help he needed but couldn't speak of. He was in quicksands and clutching at me but, but I wasn't holding him out. I, I was slipping in with him and I didn't know that. I didn't know anything except that I loved him unendurably without being able to help him or help myself. Then I found out in, in the worst possible of all ways, but for suddenly coming into a room, which I thought was empty, but that, that wasn't empty, it had two people in it, the, the boy that I had married and an older gentleman, which had been his friend for years. A locomotive is heard approaching outside. She claps her hands to her ears and crouches over. The headlight of the locomotive glares into the room as it thunders past. As the noise recedes, she straightens slowly and continues speaking. Afterwards, we pretended as if nothing had been discovered. Yes, the three of us drove out to Moon Lake Casino, very drunk and laughing all the way. Polka music sounds in a minor key, faint with distance. We danced the Varsavania. <laughs> Suddenly, in the middle of the dance, the boy I had married broke away from me and ran out of the casino. A few minutes later, a shot. The polka stops abruptly. Blanche rises stiffly, then the polka resumes in a major key. I ran out. All did. All ran and gathered around the terrible thing at the edge of the lake. And I couldn't get near for the crowding, and then someone caught my arm. Don't you go any closer. Come back. You don't want to see. See? See what? And then I heard the voices say, Alan, Alan, the gray boy. He stuck his revolver into his mouth and fired so that the back of his head had been blown away. She sways and covers her face. And it's because on the dance floor, unable to stop myself, I suddenly said, I saw, I know, and you disgust me. And then the searchlight that had been turned on and the world was turned off again. And never for one moment since has there been any light stronger than this kitchen candle. Mitch gets up awkwardly and moves toward her a little. The polka music increases. Mitch stands beside her. 
He drops her slowly into his arms. We need somebody. And I need somebody too. Could it be you and me, Blanche? She stares at him vacantly for a moment, then with a soft cry huddles in his embrace. She makes a sobbing effort to speak, but the words won't come. He kisses her forehead and her eyes and finally her lips. The polka music fades out. Her breath is drawn and released in, a lo in long, grateful sobs. Sometimes there's God so quick 